Well, there is a lot to know about baptism. When we are baptized, we are risen with Christ. Baptism is the beginning of many things in the spirit. It's the beginning of our journey. We begin to be even a bigger target for Satan, and we begin to carry a cross, and we begin to need nourishment from the Lord. Also, and most important, when we are baptized, our name is written down in the book of life, and all our sins are forgiven of the Lord. Being one of the Lord's is a great thing, for the scriptures say, if God is for us, who can be against us? I am going to touch a little on what Jesus had to do that we might be saved. In order that we might be saved, Jesus had to come from heaven and die on the cross for our sins. When we are baptized, we have fellowship with God. But if we are separated from God by sin, and if we are full of sin, this is hardly possible, because God is righteous. Isaiah Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So this is why Jesus had to redeem us. We needed a righteous man that could redeem us from our sins, and Jesus was the only righteous man. So by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins of the whole world, we can now be baptized into Christ. Because of Christ, our sins have been washed away. Without Christ, baptism is pointless. Without Christ, God is not working in baptism. God is using baptism as a resource to save us from our sins. Before we were baptized, we were filthy from, with sins. But the minute we came up from that water, we were cleansed and spotless. Through our baptism, God did a mighty work in us. We are now part of the body because of this great work God did in us. But only God could do this work. Men do not have the power to do it. I want to read to you what Jesus says about, about this. With men, it is impossible, with, but with God, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. We are now dead unto this world and alive unto God, Brother Given said. When we are dead unto the world, we no longer participate in its works. And in other words, we are now free from the world of sin. John 8, 36 says, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. We are now free from death and now have eternal life because of what Jesus did. And what does it mean to be risen with Christ? Well, it means now we have identity with Christ and his life. We are like Christ and we have fellowship with him. Only those that are risen with Christ will go to heaven. After we are baptized, the Lord begins to provide resources that he did not provide before, things that we will need on our journey. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These are some of the many things that God has provided for us on this journey. But only those that are in the Lord will he provide these things for. Isn't this a relief, brethren, to know that we can now come freely to God and not have any sin to worry about and to know that we are redeemed? and to know that God is providing all our need. Well, I believe I speak for all of us when I say this is a true blessing. Amen. Amen. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. It's quite a text before us. I want to give some preliminary considerations. I've titled this sermon, The Operation of God, because that is the point. God is the worker in the text. He's the one that puts you in Christ. He's the one that enables you to die with Christ. And he's the one that raises you with Christ. This is the operation of God. See, in salvation, God does what only God can do. God's not in the business of doing what men can do. We've said this over and over, but it's good to remind ourselves in the day when men attach God's name so much to things that all kinds of men can do and call it a blessing or whatever, that we have to underline this over and over. What God does, no man can do. Salvation belongs to the Lord. To Him. By virtue of this, only He can do it. See? Amen. 
There are certain things that if we commit ourselves to the operation of them, nothing good is going to come of it. You know, you can put Goliath's sword in my hand, and I'm not, I'm not going to get near or done what David gets done. And if I were to step into the cockpit of a, of a plane, boy, I couldn't get anything done with that. There's no way I could do that. I have no idea how to operate a plane. I couldn't do that. But if you put a pilot who's trained to do that, well, he could get you here to anywhere because he's able to do that. That's what operation is. It means the effectual working. He's able to do this. See? You put salvation to any and in the hand of anybody else but Christ, nothing good's going to come of it. It's in his hand. It's the operation of God working through Christ. And that's so critical for us to understand that. It's his operation. Now, you'll notice in the text there's a total absence of human works. What you do becomes a product of what's happening in this text. It's not that there aren't things that we do, but what we do is shaped by what he has done. It's what he has done that is in this text I say that because the brethren here are being tempted to add the human philosophies and the works of men because they, maybe they wouldn't say it, but they think there is some measure of incompleteness in what Christ has done. So they have to add this and add this. And this is no new thing. The Galatians did the same thing. Tried to add the law and add this thing, add certain things to it because they believed that somehow it was incomplete. But Paul's message to Colossians is you're complete in Christ. And everything that God does, he does through Christ Jesus. It's so critical that we understand that. Another thing that you'll notice in this text is that the child of God is somewhat of a dichotomy. Two, two seemingly irreconcilable things actually come together in the child of God. We are dead on one sense, and we are alive on another sense. See? If ye be dead with Christ, ye shall also live with him. See, so the child of God has both of these things. I say this because you want to see that burial... We'll get to this here in just a little bit. Has to do with the continuing effects of death that go on as long as we are in Christ Jesus. Okay, and I'll get to that here in just a second. But it's so important to see that death and life work in the child of God, and they're both effectual for the working that God requires of man. Another thing to see here is the only way to profit from Christ's work in the gospel is to be joined to him. You're buried with him. And that is the point of baptism, isn't it? It's to be joined with Christ. In fact, if you're not joined to Christ, you were never baptized. You were just dunked in water, right? Amen. It's the joining to Christ that enables you to die. And you die his death. You're buried by baptism into his death. And then you being joined to Christ enables you to be risen together with him. See, so that's the critical thing to be seen here. And I'm going to talk some about that this morning, about being joined to Christ. Because what we see in the text is God is the primary operator. He's the one that puts you in Christ. He's the one that enabled you to die with Christ. And he's the one that made you live with Christ. But he operates through Christ. It's through his son. That's what it means for the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in him bodily. It means Christ is the only place where God is working. Effectually in the work of salvation. Only place. The only way for you to become the workmanship of God is to be created in Christ Jesus. That's the only way. So God, brethren, has infinitely blessed you by putting you in the place where he works. And that's in his son. And so those are the things that we want to see this morning. The people of God are not self-made people. They are not the product of their own doings. They're not the product of a human system contrived by men. They're not. They're the product of God's operation. Amen. So important that we see that. Thy people all shall be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands. My hands. That I may be glorified. 
Because God can't be glorified by the hands of men. He's glorified by the work of his own hands. And by the way, that happens to be a work that no man can do. Isn't this one way that we identify the work of men? Is to be able to recognize the person who did the work based on the work that's done. I'll tell you right now, I can look at this pulpit right now and tell you, I already know Hannah didn't build this pulpit. When you talk about a change of nature and a death that's productive and being risen from the dead, you have left the realm of human ability. Amen. We're talking about Amen. something only God can do and only through Christ Jesus could it possibly be done. I want, to, I want to show that this morning. So let's look at this. Now, it's the work of God that we're in Christ Jesus, and you don't want to just pass by that. It's not a simple thing, brethren, to be in Christ. It's mentioned over and over and over in the scriptures, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. But this is no simple work and no little work. I can assure you it's not the result of some little ditty prayer prayed by a man to ask God into their heart and just it just kind of happens. It's not really like that. That's a misrepresentation. You only have to do this. You only have to say these words, and it's this simple. I do not like simplicity to being attached to a work that requires that a righteous God make an unrighteous man righteous so that he can be joined to Christ. I'll tell you, this is no simple work. This is a work of God. In fact, it is categorically said in the scriptures, of God are you in Christ Jesus. The fact that God's in the work at all tells you it's not a simple work. So what I want to do is just kind of unpack part of what's involved in that because that's the key issue here in this text is to be in Christ because everything that happens in it flows from that. Of God are you in Christ Jesus. You know, that statement kind of reminds me of another one in Scripture. Ephesians 2.8, I was talking with Brother Given about this this morning. By grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Well, that's not a lot of words, but when you begin to look at what's involved in that, there's a lot involved in that. There's a lot of prep work that's required in saving men, and there's a lot of prep work that's required in you being in Christ Jesus. And it's all God's prep work. Amen. God's done it. So let's look at this. What's involved? What's required to be put into Christ Jesus? Well, how about for one, a person has to be drawn to Jesus. Has to be drawn to Jesus. We have this word in the scriptures. John 6, 44 to 45. No man can come to me. This is Jesus' word on it. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. It's got to be drawn. God is not going to put anybody in Christ who doesn't see their need for Christ. In fact, there isn't any, th any such thing as someone indifferent to Christ that's in Christ. There isn't any such thing. Amen. This had to be done. If a person is going to come into Christ, they have to be drawn to him. It's like a, it's a work kind of like Hosea said, you know, God spoke through Hosea. He said, I will allure her out into the wilderness and speak comfortably yeah. to her. You remember when God convinced you of your sin? What kind of a wilderness that was? You found out that you were in a place where there were no resources to sustain life. You were in a land where no water was and you couldn't get what you needed for yourself. See, that's like a wilderness. And it's then that, G that God began to speak comfortably to you. Have you considered my son? Do you know that he died to put sin away? Do you know this? Yes, indeed, you're not righteous and you're unacceptable, but there is a man who's accepted in my sight. Hey, go to him. What is that? That was God drawing you to Christ. That was God drawing you to Christ. I will raise him up at the last day, it is written, the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh to me. What is that? That's the operation of God. God, if you feel a drawing to Christ, that really is a miracle. Men can't trump up being drawn to Christ. In fact, when men looked at Christ through the wisdom of men, they killed him. Right? That's what they did. 
this is a work of God. You have to be drawn to him. Another thing, how about this? How about trusting in Christ or having faith in Christ? Is it, really, is it possible to be in Christ without faith in Christ? Well, here automatically, the man in the pride of his own works automatically stands up and says, ha ha, but see, I got my faith on my own. Because faith, as you know, is an intellectual assent to facts. You know, there was a commercial back in the early 90s that was promoted by a church in this area that had a man on there that defined faith exactly that way. Is that really what it is? Huh? Is that really what it is? You think God gave you a brain and just your Bible and you can figure it all out? It's just a matter of assenting to the truth? Is that really, is that really what faith is? Well, if faith is of God, I tell you, that's not what faith is, but faith is of God. We, like Peter has said, have obtained like precious faith. Huh? It's been given to you not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? If you have faith, it's been given to you. Amen. Faith is of God. It came from him, and that's how you have it. And you do have to have it to be in Christ. Now, I know, brother, and you have to keep the faith. But he was the source of you getting it in the first place. See, the operation of God in putting you in Christ, that's his work. It's unique to God alone because only he can do it. He gave, you, he gave you that faith. How about the necessity of washing? I do not like that prayer that I mentioned earlier. To ask the Lord to come into your heart. I don't like the idea of asking Jesus to come into a dirty heart. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right at all. You have to be clean for Christ to dwell in you. You have to be clean, perfectly clean, wholly clean for Christ to dwell in your hearts by faith. It's not a simple matter. huh? In fact, your sins were like red like crimson. No man could even wash himself from even one sin, let alone all the sins he's committed in his life. There is one who has done the effectual washing. And he is the one that has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's Christ. He's the one. He's the one that's done this. You remember him? Remember Peter? One time, remember, he was, he was so struck with the humility of Christ that there on that night of the Lord's Supper, Jesus laid aside his garments. And he took a basin and a towel and girded himself, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Well, he came to Peter, and Peter could not see this at all. This, this cannot be right for you to wash my feet. He said, you can't wash my feet. Remember what Jesus said? If I do not wash you, you have no part of me. Now, that's how critical washing is. If he doesn't wash you, you can't be in Christ. And he happens to be the only one who can do it. See, I'm showing you this is an operation of God. So, brethren, if you're in Christ, see, that's a marvelous evidence of sanctification. You're washed. You're clean. And, in fact, there's an ongoing maintenance of cleansing that takes place. When you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses you from all sin. He does the cleansing. Your job is to stay clean. But he does the cleansing. See, this is an operation of God. Being in Christ is no simple matter. It involves a number of very critical things. You know that that's the case because when Paul prayed for a church of believing people, he prayed to the Father of the whole family in heaven and on earth that you might be strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man so that Christ can dwell in your heart. Amen. Getting him in is one thing. Him staying there is another thing. I'm telling you, being in Christ is not a simple work. God is the one that has done this. And if you can see that, I'll tell you, you will not neglect your fellowship with Christ if you can see that this is something only God could do. Of God, are you in Christ Jesus? It's his work. And it's so important that we recognize that that is, in fact, the case. Now, why is it so critical to, to, to make that point? You're buried with him. You're risen with him. 
Why is this with him? Why is that such a critical point? Because first off, dying and living are necessary to fellowship with Christ Jesus and God. There's some things you've got to be separated from. You've got to die to them if you're going to walk with God. There's some things that got to go. they got to go. You can't walk with God while you have these certain things. There are certain things you have to die to. And there are certain things you have to live to. Things that you are conscionable of. Things that you live in the awareness of. Things that your life becomes the product of your conviction of these things. See? It's got to happen. And it, the proper dying and the proper living only happens as you are joined to Christ Jesus. That's where it happens. So let's look at that. It's the work of God that caused us to be dead and to be buried with Christ. Now, no, well, that, that was actually backwards. That's the way people say it in the world, right? Dead and buried. In the kingdom, it's actually the opposite. You're buried, then you die. Buried, then you die. I'll get to that in just a second. Death and burial is a means of permanent separation from whatever you're dying to. It's like Job said in the scriptures, Job chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, and Job happened to know somewhat about death, seeing as he was right at the door of death itself. And he said this, As the cloud is consumed and vanished away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. I'm into that kind of dying. There are certain things that I've died to. I don't want nothing else to do with those things. No more. Then the scripture said that you live the rest of your life no more to the lust of man but to the will of God. Huh? That's the kind of death we're talking to. Talking about no more. He shall return no more to his house. Neither shall his place know him anymore. That's death. And that's burial. It's a permanent separation from certain things that we must be separated from to walk and to live with God. I'm reminded of David, you know, in, that, in, uh, in the sin against Uriah the Hittite. That child that came as a result of that sin, you may recall, this, that child died. And it was a burden to the servants of David because they saw how he lamented and prayed unto God while the child was still sick and not dead yet. So after, he, after the child had died, they said, well, we can't, how are we going to tell David this? But they went ahead and went in and told him, and they were surprised at his reaction because he washed himself and he took food, and there didn't seem to be the kind of lamentation that he had before. And you remember what David's explanation was? He said, he is now dead. So why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Separation. Now, brethren, that's a marvelous view of spiritual life. Hmm? You know, there are certain people that you can't have good fellowship with. Because there are certain things that you're dead to that they're not. You can't, like, go to them. You know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying here? You, you don't have a, there's like a separation. Because you're dead. Certain things you're dead to. And there are certain things, brother, we do not go back to. We're dead to them. We're buried. And some things, we're still in the tomb. We're not actively involved in these things anymore. We're separated from them. That's the dying and the, and the burial of Christ Jesus. And how necessary is separation from these things? Well, here's God's word to men, and this is the mandate from heaven. Wherefore, come out from among them and be. He didn't say get separated. He said be. He's talking to a church that's already been separated. Amen. Be ye separated. Amen. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Yes. Now, brethren, again, we're talking about the operation of God. The critical matters in salvation, God does through Christ Jesus. Amen. There are things you have got to be dead to. Because if you rebuild the things that have been destroyed, you're going to die. So let's look at some of those things that we are, in fact, dead to. 
Now, I want to get back to this. Let me, let me say this before I actually get to that here in just a second, because this is a critical point, especially in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, that we are buried first and then we die. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 and 4 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That is to say, at the point at which your spirit was joined to the Lord, at that point there were certain things you died to. Certain things you died to. Now, I don't hear men often emphasize this, but this is the truth. When you're joined to Christ, you die to certain things. It's not just when you join to Christ, you live to certain things, you die to certain things. You're baptized into his death, see? In other words, you die to the things that he died to. That's, that's kind of the bottom line. But the thing to see here is, see, Jesus' death is an accomplishment. Under the normal circumstances, when people live and then they die and they're buried, it's, a, it's like a defeat. It's not an accomplishment. Nothing good comes out of the ordinary means by which a man dies. It's a defeat. But Jesus' death wasn't a defeat, was it? His was an accomplishment, wasn't it? Amen. The death which I must accomplish. Well, that's not the way men talk when they're on their dying bed, but it is the way Jesus talked when he went to his death. Because Jesus knew there was a glory that followed his death. There were productive things that would result from his death. Let's look at just a few of those things. How about this? When he died, he destroyed the devil. Destroyed the devil. It says, For inasmuch as then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Destroyed him. Through his death. See? A productive death, I might add. Or how about this? In Colossians 2.15 says that he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in his death. It's a productive, productive death. Or how about this? He blotted out the ordinances, the handwriting of ordinances that were under the law that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's what he did in his death. See, Jesus' death is a productive death. When you die with Christ, your dying becomes productive in the Lord too. That's the thing that I want you to see. It becomes productive. You are assisted, brethren, in your walk with God by the things which God separates you from when you are put in Christ. Amen. Let's look at some of these. One of the obvious ones, of course, anybody could stand up and say it. You know exactly what I'm going to say first. Sin. Big issue. Sister Annie already mentioned this. Big issue. Your sins have separated between you and your God. There is not a chance that you're going to walk with God while walking in sin at the same time. You've got to die to it. And it's got to be like a burial thing. You can't have sin and walk with God. It cannot be. So what did he do? He made you to die to sin. I mean, what's the devil going to do with people that are dead to sin? This is a marvelous thing. You know, the more closely you draw to Jesus, the less vulnerable you are to temptations of sin. It's the way it works. The further you drift from Christ, hey, you're in the hands of the Amalekites, those easy temptations. They'll pick you off every time. We're dead to sin in Christ Jesus. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are, are not were, are dead to sin, live any longer in it? That's separation. This life has no place for the continuance of sin. Hmm? How can you continue in it when you know it's the very thing that Jesus died to put away? According to the prophet of Daniel, he made an end of transgressions. He destroyed the works of the devil, which is causing men to sin. He made an end of sin. When John saw Jesus for the first time, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when you are joined to him, 
that work of taking sin away becomes effectual in your own life. You are actually separated from iniquities, judicially and experientially. Before God, you are righteous. It's a legal matter with God. Sins have been atoned for and paid for. You have, in fact, been redeemed. The debt you have before God is not to sin, but the continuing debt of love that you owe to him that died to put your sins away. You are dead to sin. That's a marvelous truth. So we can say to the saints of God, if any man sin, if, if, if any man sin, we have an advocate with God. Because we know this is a disruption of spiritual life, sin is. Thank God for that kind of a death. God, be thanked that though you were the servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart the form of the doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sins, you became the servants of God. Hey, every man is either going to serve sin or serve God. When you are buried with Christ into death, you stop serving sin and you start serving God. This is a marvelous truth, brethren, but only God can do this. Only God, only God can turn a man from his iniquities, right? Amen. Only God can do this. And the truth is, the more you can behold of the beauty of the Lord, the more you will hate sin. See? Not only now do you have to have sin put away to have fellowship with him, but now as you join in fellowship with him, it assists you in staying separate from iniquity. What a truth. This is a great work God has done, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We've died, died to sin. We've also died to this present evil world. If our death is like Christ's death, and it is, you're baptized into his death, Jesus said, upon going to the cross, the world seeth me no more. No more. Not, not, not going to accommodate myself to coming back and living in this world again. It's not that way. When Jesus died, he left here. He didn't die and then come back and set up a kingdom on earth and accommodate himself to a physical form like he had while he was here. No, he died. He left here. Because when you die, you die to the world. Hey, the world doesn't see you anymore. Some, some young lady uh, we, we talked to at, at the emergency clinic, I went to get my leg attended to, and she was talking about a sin that she wasn't bashful about at all. And I told Tasha, I said, if she knew who I was, she wouldn't have been talking about that. See, I'm dead to the world. It doesn't know who I am. Who I am as a son of God is not accommodated to fleshly eyes. You, you don't look at this body and see it. I understand where the wind blows. I understand that. I live differently. I know that. But they don't see the true essence of who you are because you're dead to the world. You're like Christ. You're dead to the world. Amen. Isn't that what Galatians says? That he gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. He's done that. Only God can do that. Only God can make you a stranger in this world. He's the only one who can do that. Well, you can tell people all day long to be strangers, but until God enters into the work, they are never going to let go of the world. God's the one that makes you to be joined to Christ into his death. Part of that is dying to the world. Thank God, brother. Now, you know what? We don't even look to the things which are seen. And if for chance something inside of us is pulling us to look, it hurts us. Doesn't it hurt you? Well, I hate that. I hate that. I would to God. All that was in me was the work of God, but it's not. We already talked about this this morning. Satan has a part in us, doesn't he? But it pains me that it's so. We look not to the things which are seen, but to things which are not seen. That's an evidence of being delivered from the world. That's a work of God. It's the operation of God has done that in you, and that's the result of being joined to Christ Jesus. And one more thing, I'll tell you, selfish interests are so prevalent. I wouldn't doubt around the world, but I especially feel it 
in this American culture we lived in. When Brother Gibbon and I went to India, I'll tell you, when we came back, this, I was like heightenedly sensitive about this kind of thing. That men were selfishly, they were living for themselves. Huh? It's all about them and what they want and what they're doing. And I have the right to this and I can do that. That's unfortunately, an affluent society appeals to selfish interests. But the truth be known, you're selfish until God delivers you from it. And he does it in the death of Christ Jesus. That's where it happens. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Peter said, For inasmuch as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. When Jesus died, brethren, and just the suffering in the flesh when he lived in the world, he did that to God. Didn't he cry out to God with strong cries and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared? He went to death because his conscientability toward God, his love of God moved him. He wasn't living for selfish interests. He was living for the will of God. Amen. And Peter says, when you can see that, you won't live for self either. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Hey, brother, most of our sufferings have been the result of selfish thoughts. And when you begin to hurt because of selfish thoughts, then you won't give yourself to sin, right? Hmm? We're tempted by this. Tempted to live for yourself at times, see? You don't do that in Christ Jesus. See, there is a constraining power that's in the cross of Christ Jesus that when you see it, you won't live for yourself. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You cannot look to an unselfish Christ and see him with perceptive eyes dying for God's will and then promote your own. You won't do this. This is part of being joined to Christ Jesus is understanding his death. And when you die with Christ, you say, not my will, but thine be done. Right? That's dying. Brethren, thank God for the dying, but not just the dying, there's living there's a living. Dying is not an end of itself. It's not. You know, there's a lot of dying religion in the world today. It's like a, a resurrection of the pharisaical approach to living unto God. You know, they tie this, they tie this, they don't do this. It's like whitewashed sepulchers, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. It's like a house that's Maybe the wicked spirit's been driven out, and outwardly they appear to be righteous, but that wicked spirit goes and finds seven spirits more wicked than itself and comes back and occupies that place. If your religion is simply about denying, you'll actually get worse. You will. I've done this, and you will get worse. We die in order to live. In fact, that's why God killed, that, that's why you died. It's so that God could raise you from the dead because that's who God raises from the dead. In other words, you die, God put you in Christ so that you would die in the prospect of the life he had for you. It's like Jesus said. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. And then he gives this exhortation. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. He's like encouraging you to think this way. There is life eternal out there. Now, if you'll die to this earthly life, I'll give you eternal life. So we actually die in the prospect of eternal life. Hmm? Remember what Peter said? We've left all to follow you. What shall we have? Well, Jesus said, well, there's a lot of good things coming. You'll never regret dying with Christ Jesus. Because when you die with Christ, you live with Christ. 
Think of it this way. When you were joined to Christ in his baptism, you died his death. When you are risen with Christ, you live his life. Now, the things that I'm going to say now are the product of what Brother Gibbon said on Wednesday night because that was so marvelous. Remember those distinctions he made about resurrection life and about the raisings that he did in the earth not being resurrections? When that first hit me, I, I, I had to think about that for a little bit, but it made perfect sense when you realize what resurrection is. Resurrection power is not for the purpose of accommodating a person to this world and this life. That's not what it is. Amen. In fact, the truth be known, you can be living in the heart of the great power of God coming down to you every day, being renewed every day, and yet the outward man be wasting away. Right? right. We got brethren right now, the outward man is wasting away. But they are stronger in the spirit now than they've ever been before. Amen. What is that? That's resurrection power. The truth of the matter is when resurrection power is exerted, it may have no impact at all on your old man. Because it's not for the old man. It's not for the natural man. You see, we've borne the image of the earthy. But being raised with the power of God means bearing the image of the Lord of heaven. And when Jesus was raised, he did not come back to this life or accommodate himself to this world. When he was raised, he went home to glory. Hmm? And even before he died, he was anticipating being there with the glory that he had with the Father before the world was. He wasn't, brethren, he wasn't thinking about setting up a kingdom on earth and reigning for a thousand years. That is, Brother Given, that, was, that is so true. That is so foolish. That is a gross misunderstanding of resurrection power. Resurrection power is a power that raises you up to a life that accommodates you for a heavenly habitat. The God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And raised up to us, us up together with him and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ. That's what resurrection power is for. It's for living in heavenly places. Why? Because that's where the blessings are. The blessings are there. Hmm? We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Where is it at? Somewhere on the earth? Huh? Some citadel on earth we can go to? Huh? Some guru on earth that's got the 10-step plan of how to stay away from sin and to excel in is that Is that where the citadel is? No, it's not. It's in heaven. <laughs> it's in heaven. If you're going to be blessed in Christ, you've got to be in the right place. Amen. And that's what resurrection power is all about. It is so that you can be raised up with Christ into heavenly places. Hmm? When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he wanted them to know the exceeding greatness of his power, which is toward them that believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, when you're raised from the dead by that power, you're seated in the heavenly places too. Amen. God's blessed, you're blessed, Jesus is blessed, angels are blessed because they're beholding. I'll tell you, this is a place of great blessing. If you live where the resurrection power puts you, you'll stay alive. In fact, that's, that's boy, that's a gross misunderstanding of what this power is about. You'll excel in life. You, you grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ in these heavenly places. That's where you excel. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I'm so thankful for this. I think of what Paul said to the Corinthians. He says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things are made new. So what does that mean? When you were made new, did it change anything on earth? Did it change anything in heaven? No, it didn't change, it didn't change a thing on the earth. It didn't change a thing in heaven, but you were changed. And not only were you changed, but your habitat 
changed. The place where you lived changed. Now I like to think of old things passed away as being like the earth. That's not where our habitat is anymore. That's not where we live. You're living in the place now where all things are new. Hmm? Everything's new. In the heavenly places, it's all about new things, isn't it? Yes. Amen. That's the sense in which this resurrection power has been exerted. It's put you in a place where all things are new. And so, yeah, you have to live in the body here on earth where the old things are passed away. But your life is hid with Christ in God where all things are new. If you live there where the operation of God puts you, you'll excel. You'll advance. But the point of this morning's sermon is this. It's all of God. God puts you in Christ. God calls you to be dead with Christ. And after you were dead with Christ, God's the one that raised you up with Christ. And so when he says this is all through the faith of the operation of God, so what does that mean? It means God operated through you because you believed and trusted in God alone through Christ Jesus that the work would be done. A work that you couldn't do that he does do. Now listen, here is the burden of the work of the wicked one. To get your trust in God to be displaced by some other thing. That's what was so burdensome to Paul, to the Colossians, because he knew if they tried to add human philosophy to faith in Christ Jesus, Christ would stop working in the people. The operation happened through the faith of the operation of God. When you trusted in him alone, you said, salvation is of the Lord, and I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh. I will not trust in chariots. I will not trust in horses. I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord my God. Amen. And God operated in you. Now, the same way, brethren, this new life began is the way it continues. And so I leave you with that exhortation. Paul says, as you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. Brother, and I encourage you to do the same. You know how you received him. God was the worker Amen. through your faith in Christ Jesus. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, brethren. You'll be saved. Thank Amen. you, brethren.